welcome to the inter Aspen interview series on lipids and parental nutrition. My name is Jay Martello. I'm clinical practice specialist for the American Society for Parental and Natural Nutrition and uh, Professor Emeritus at The Ohio State University. In this series, we're going to be talking with international experts on nutrition about lipids and parental nutrition with an emphasis on omega-3 fatty acids, uh, use of lipids in a variety of different patient conditions, as well as uh, some data on cost effectiveness of parental lipid emulsions. It's really been my pleasure to get to talk with the leading experts in the field. Uh, today, we're going to focus a little bit more specifically on omega-3 fatty acids. And my expert today is uh, uh, Dr. Bob Martindale, professor of surgery at the, uh, at the Oregon Health Sciences uh, University in Portland, Oregon. Welcome, Bob. It's a pleasure to see you. Hey, good to see you. Glad to be here. Well, let's get started and uh, talk about these omega-3 fatty acids. And the, the first question we have is, uh, in the hospital, what patient populations do you think would benefit from lipid emulsions that contain omega-3s? Yeah, I think that, you know, omega-3s, omega I look at containing lipid emulsions, I look at it as a second generation of the lipid emulsions. Obviously, the first generation were the pure soy-based lipids. And I think we've evolved from there. And now we know we can get a mixed, more physiologic solution. And so I think people that need, really anybody uh, that needs intravenous lipid emulsion should probably, I feel, should be on a mixed lipid emulsion. <laughs> I think there's very little use for the old soy-based formulas. They're not bad. It's just mm -hmm. I think it's a better formula now. And you're consistent with other experts that talked about that. And we say, what population? They say, oh. And... Uh, and, and talk about balance. I think it's uh, interesting to reiterate that here as well. So yeah, I think that, you know, when they, when they came available on the market, August of 2016, I think it was, uh, we, we looked at it and said, well, sure, there's a small cost difference, but that's, let's look at the big picture here. And why would we have two lipids? And we got to explain and try to teach residents there's two and why you have two and all that business. Let's just say that's the standard one. And for the rare occasion, we need a pure soy base, like an overdose of a uh, uh, fat soluble drug. We still use the soy base, you know, things like that. But otherwise, we just switched over. Great. You know, you've worked with a few guidelines, especially critical, uh, critically ill patients. And so one of the, one of the questions relates to, uh, with regards to guidelines, uh, what, what, what do they say about use of omega-3s in parental nutrition? Well, uh, the U.S. guidelines, as you know, they take a couple of years from when you complete, when you decide when to stop collecting data, collecting new pa papers for the guidelines and consensus. So in the 2016 guidelines, you'll notice that we still don't ha have discussion of a soy-based or a mixed lipid solution. And that's because it wasn't available in the U.S. at the time. But we, in the discussion section, we talk about when these become available, we believe this will be the, the standard use. So I think that's a little confusion. When you just read the comment, the statement, you say, well, they don't say to give it. They don't say to give a mixed lipid emulsion. Well, it's because they weren't available at, in 2016. Now, remember the, the papers that we collected papers between 2009 and 2013. So that five year, four and a half year period, where we, those are the papers we had to use. And we, we finished December 13th, 2000, excuse me, December 31st, 2013 was when we stopped adding new papers to it. And so that really took two years to get it in the press after that, two and a half years. And so there lies the problem. So really, by the time that guideline was published, we already had two year lag on the, on the references we could use. So we knew that was coming. So we added that statement to the discussion because we knew it was going to happen. Right. And so, you know, we look at uh, lipid use in, uh, in guidelines, whatever I've noticed in the European guidelines, they talk about uh, omega-3s and critical illness as well as surgery. Uh, have you thoughts or what do you uh, cover as well as a surgical resident ask you, well, what dose of omega-3 fatty acids would be a would be the dose we would use for that patient population. Yeah, I like, uh, you know, for a dose level, 
uh, I, I kind of go along with the European guidelines, which is 0.1 gram per kilo per day, 0.1 to 0.2 gram per kilo per day, which I think is very reasonable. Uh, I think that's a dose which is attainable in a solution which contains 10% uh, lipid, fish oil lipid. I think we, we certainly can get to that level. You know, intrally, it's a whole different story because then we talk about absorption, dynamics, and you know, micelle formation, and how it gets absorbed and distribution of the fat. So it's a little different. Uh, you know, we have our immune modulating formulas intrally have higher levels of fish oils, but we have to worry about absorption and things. So when you're giving it intravenously, we know we've got that level because we're giving it obviously in the vein. Right, you bypass that. That yeah, big you bypass the, controls all the, the questions. <laughs> You have any other thing else to add that's been very interesting uh, talking about this topic with you? No, I think uh, I, I'm very happy they're available. I, I believe, I strongly believe they make a difference in our patients. I, uh, I be, you know, I'm a big advocate of the, all the work by Charlie Surhan's group and now all of his disciples all over the world in that resolution of inflammation is a big issue. And that's where I think the fish oils really play a role. You know, we know that giving them preventatively to prevent the inflammation, they're helpful. But I think now all that concept of the SPMs or what used to be called resolvins and protectins are now called these specialized pro-resolving mediators because we found so many of them. You know, they virtually everywhere across the board, they've been shown to be beneficial in helping resolve the inflammatory focus, which brought someone to the ICU. You know, whatever got you there, whether it be a medical ICU situation and whether it be inflammatory, you know, arthritis and cardiac disease and a MI and ischemia reperfusion and, you know, sepsis and on surgery, all the surgical issues down the line. So if we can resolve the inflammatory process faster, the patient's going to have less hyperdynamic state and they're going to require less of all, all the other nutritional, nutritional issues. I mean, you know, their catabolic state goes down faster and they improve much faster. And that, I think, is the beauty of having the availability to give intravenous omega-3 or oral omega-3, whatever. It's just somehow get the omega-3 and our bodies will make these SPMs. We don't have to buy SPMs and give them. We can make them if, if the substrate is available in the serum at the time of the inflammatory process. That's great. You know, it ac actually kind of emphasizes back even the basics of us redefining malnutrition, making sure that people understand it's, and one, it's a disease. And secondly, that whenever a disease process is involved with it, there's some form of inflammation. And so almost yeah. all levels of our patient populations, we have to be cognizant of that fact uh, that uh, inflammation is a, is a part of the disease process that we need to treat just like any other, uh, any other condition that's, uh, that's around. You know, even, you know, I, I've been recently doing a lot of work in nutrition and cancer. And, you know, I've been following the history of that. And we used to talk about, nutri you know, cancer being a neoplastic process and controlling the cell division and some genetic abnormality causing it. Now they're talking about cancer as an inflammatory disease, mm -hmm. whether inflammation started the neoplastic process or now it's an active and player in the neoplastic process. So yeah. even, even, even cancer, which we thought for a long time was just purely a genetic abnormality, which is causing defect in the cell. Now we know it's inflammatory. And so I, I, I think that when we look virtually, you know, psychiatric disease now is inflammatory. You've got some alteration in biochemistry in the brain causing inflammation, different focus, different areas. We can alter depression, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar disease now by altering inflammatory changes. I mean, it's it's such a such a wonderful area we've got to focus now. Whether it be probiotics or omega threes, it's a lot of it's related to inflammation. Mm -hmm. Well, again, thank you so much. It's been a joy uh, talking to you about this topic. I think we could probably go on all day. Um, so, if the audience would like to have further information on lipids and parenting nutrition, I refer you to the supplement published in JPen in uh, February of two thousand twenty, which can be found at. Uh, the Aspen website at nutritioncare, uh, www.nutritioncare.org. And if you haven't listened to the other interviews in the series, I'd strongly recommend you, you take a look at them. I think 
getting this varied perspective. And if you listen to all of them, there's a common thread that, that we're listening with regards to getting a balance of lipid emulsions for our patients would probably be, be beneficial. Addressing inflammation as a part of the disease process from a nutrition standpoint is something that uh, we need to consider as well. Very good.